That's right. Welcome along to another episode of the Rated RR podcast. We're on to 41 episodes and it's been immense. The support you've been giving all of us, me and Rosh especially, are very grateful. So continue to like, share and subscribe. Roshan, how are you feeling this week? I'm feeling great. I'm feeling great as always. You know, delighted to be a part of this podcast and very happy with the support that we've gotten. And also the great guest that we're going to have on this week's episode, Rasha. Why don't you introduce him? Yep, talking about excited. I'm excited to have the guest on board. It's the General Secretary of the Football Association of Singapore, Yazin Buhari. Yazin, how are you doing? Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on board. Well, two weeks since the end of Suzuki. Uh, whether we are over it or whether we are still recovering, uh, I'm not really sure. But I am still recovering from that month or two of uh, madness. Yeah, Yazin, you know, before we get into the serious stuff, you know, you used to be a, a referee. I remember when I was playing, you were one of the referees there. Do you remember uh, taking charge of any of the matches that I was involved in? Uh, yes, I do remember. Wow. Uh, not very clearly. And that's a good thing because when you yeah. don't remember any incidences in a match, that means the player has been good, the referee has been good. So we both get the accolades. <laughs> yeah, you know why You know why I asked that? Because I used to, to shout at referees a lot. I used to be quite quite uh, vocal. And, uh, you know, Yazin was one of the few ones who I thought was, was good enough not to get a shouting at. Uh, so it's great that he doesn't remember. Anyway, moving but, on. And you yeah, mentioned but I, that... do, I, I, I do remember, Rusha, I mean, yeah. Bisham Stadium when you were playing for... Uh, home United as well so I do remember <laughs> well it's great to see you where you are now and someone who you know who has knowledge of the game in in a role such as yours and you're the general secretary as Raushan alluded to in the in the uh, in the introduction what exactly does a general secretary do why don't you give us some insight into your job well uh, I think general secretary is something that's typically used in football in in most FAs uh, even in FIFA it's either general secretary or secretary general. Um, it is basically a CEO of the organization. So that's my role. My responsibilities are that of managing the association um, from the various aspects. We, I, I pretty much lead a team of administrators here in FAS to carry out uh, the, the strategies to be able to achieve the vision set by the board. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know, as much as uh, we want to be as proactive, we want to be uh, strategic. Football is football, and football is a reactive sport because of the, the 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 pool that it gets, because of the attention that it brings. I think sometimes, of course, we do find ourselves in a very reactive environment, but that's what it is. And I know I speak for my colleagues as well. But one of the reasons why we love this job is. Exactly that. It, it gives you, you won't know what to expect on certain days. Uh, it could be good, it could, it could be bad, most times bad. Um, <laughs> but, but yes, I, I enjoy being here. I, I see my colleagues as a team of very passionate people trying to achieve what we can. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm accountable for how the organization do from a, from a financial standpoint, from a result standpoint. You know, the, 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 there's this joke among all the general secretaries <laughs> Uh, where if the team is doing well, is it's because of the board. When the team is not doing well, it's because of the general secretary. And we all agree with that. <laughs> uh, Yasin, speaking of doing well and challenges, the first thing we need to get stuck into is the recently con concluded AFF Suzuki Cup. From a footballing standpoint, it was entertainment beyond anything I've seen in a long while in front of our own eyes. What was it like organizing that whole thing? Because a regional tournament of that scale in a pandemic, could not have been easy, right? Of course, absolutely. I, I think before we get to the bit where we hosted the competition, I think we go back, you know, in many cases, even before the pandemic, uh, there have been plenty of disruptions to the norm uh, mm. in businesses, whether it's a new business model or new technology. And we, you know, we have seen that happen to taxi companies with the introduction of private hire vehicles, retail shopping being hit by your online uh, mm -hmm. platforms like Amazons and Shopees. So it didn't really have to be a pandemic. But when mm -hmm. the pandemic hit, I think we in FAS, we asked ourselves, so what now? Do we just stop? Do we stop doing what we have been doing? Or do we now try to look at what the strengths are? From an FAS standpoint, what is the strength Singapore has? And it was true that 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 thoughts that we came about, right, we organizationally, we have the capabilities to host events. Mm. And because of the pandemic, I think relatively Singapore had it controlled with the measures in place. And that, that was the start when we decided, okay, 
uh, CCP is going to come to town or going to happen. Let's see if we can put in a bid. And you know, when we did get the bid back in September, two things happened. One was my wife wasn't happy because <laughs> December, <laughs> December is no longer a take leave month. Yeah. Uh, but but secondly, I think more importantly, it gets us the opportunities to put in practice how innovative we can be. And that's exactly mm. what happened. I think in general, I think human beings would want to be inventive. And typically, we don't really like to sit still and just you know, let, let it just go past us. But Suzuki became a vehicle for us to further explore what exactly that we could do. So I, I'm glad, of course, the challenges, we knew of the challenges that will be in place, uh, especially so because we are so stringent with COVID, we need to ensure that certain uncomfortable things can be managed. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I, I, if I were to do it again, and I think my colleagues were not like this, but I will want to do Suzuki again if we are given the chance. Yeah. Listen, I think it was uh, organized incredibly well, right? Under the circumstances, considering all the situations that we're in and the fact that I think you had it in Singapore mean, meant we could have, you know, the Southeast Asian expat communities coming out and supporting the, the teams as well. And they were incredible. You know, some of the fans, some of the atmospheres that they created were outstanding. What, what were your thoughts on the tournament as a whole, Yazin? I know you, you, you hit the nail. I mean, the, one of the teams that we went in when we put in the bid is the huge amount of uh, people from the ASEAN community that reside here. Mm. In fact, you know, a quick number off my head is out of the population that we have, over 1.1 million uh, ASEAN communities mm, okay. here in Singapore. And I think that kind of hit uh, the right note uh, with AFF when they awarded us. And I think as a tournament, you know, it's incredible support that we got from many stakeholders, uh, you know, be it the government, uh, Sport SG, MCCY, Ministry of Health, uh, as well as your mm. venue providers, Sports Hub. They all came together and, and more more. Uh, interestingly, I think the teams that came into Singapore to participate, mm. they were well aware of the challenges that are in place uh, for the host, and they kind of stuck to that, and they they knew that, you know, okay, we are all here to play football, but look, there's going to be some things that we are not used to, and let's get that over and done with. So they did that, the fans did that, and when you see all that coming together, it was an excellent experience. Mm. Yeah, I think when we spoke to Manu Polking as well, he mentioned playing in that bubble and all that. So those are some challenges that the team faced. Yasin, I just quickly want to ask you, you mentioned the, the desire to host a Suzuki Cup again, perhaps. Is that the only tournament or can we expect other regional tournaments as the Suzuki Cup being a blueprint to possibly host another tournament? You know, I think the Suzuki, if you look at the kind of uh, competitions that we typically play, I think Suzuki is the biggest tournament that we have hosted. Ten teams, uh, the sheer number of people that are coming through the borders. Uh, and of course, Suzuki is not the only competition. The Suzuki Cup has a magic feel to it. Yeah. Right? And uh, I think that's the same in ASEAN. If you look at the likes of Thailand, the fact that they call back their, their biggest stars for the tournament is the magic of, of the competition. But of course, we want to go further. We, we do have a track record now of organizing a competition mm. of this scale. We have done it with the AFC Under-23. And of course, there's a uh, next competition that has yet to be announced whether where the host is going to be is the AFC Cup qualification and yeah, AFC yeah. Cup qualification if you look at um, where Singapore would probably sit there is a realistic chance that we should be able to or we can qualify uh, or appear in the Asian Cup in China by virtue yeah. of the qualification the last time yeah. we did it is because we were host mm. so of course and it's not just the men's game. I think women's game as well. I and mean, if you have seen uh, the women's game has just kind of risen right. in, in yeah. many aspects and uh, the opportunities are plenty. So not just the Suzuki. Suzuki has a magic to it. But, you know, I think we need to start looking at the other competitions as well. Yeah, it's great to see. Great to hear as well. And uh, we're excited at what's, uh, what's coming up. This year is going to be busy for, for Asian football as a whole. Uh, Yazin, I just wanted to get your thoughts you know, I know sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to separate yourself from that professional aspect of organizing a competition and all that comes with it and then watching games as a fan. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that semi-final against <laughs> Indonesia as a fan, if you can give us your perspective on it. You know, I watched all Singapore fans, uh, Singapore games as a fan, especially so for the <laughs> Indonesian game. I, you know, I remember and I, I 
I don't think I told my wife this. Where I was carrying my second one, and then that's when I realized that she's that heavy. Uh, <laughs> when Shadan was lining up for the free kick, and when Shadan scored that free kick, I'm not sure. I think I probably kept thinking that my daughter is one year old, and I just threw, it, threw her up in the air, and then I caught her, <laughs> and then realized, oh God, thank God I caught her because. <laughs> And and I I've not felt you know I I probably forgot that you know I, I am the GS mm. uh, but I remember catching her putting her down and I started running everywhere <laughs> twirling something that was in my hand uh, and that was that was what that game did to fans like me yeah. I, I watched the games as a fan and and I think it is not because. Not only because it's Suzuki Cup, not only because it was Indonesia that we were playing, perhaps a close rival of us, but that's what the boys did to many people. Mm. And I think from a, from a fan's perspective, I'm a Singapore fan, uh, that it did that to me. But more importantly, and I think what is very critical and what is it that we need to come uh, start building on is it turned a lot of non-Singapore fans into yes. fans. And I yeah. think that's yeah. important. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I've got people who never watched the game of Singapore's <laughs> in the Suzuki and started texting me mm. right after the, the loss against uh, Indonesia. And they said, God, I, it was Christmas night. I decided to watch Singapore game and not going out for dinner at someone's house. <laughs> and I'm glad I did that because uh, I think it's been quite some time since they experienced that. And, and I, I also think that, you no, know, if my memory doesn't fail me, that there hasn't been a case where a team was applauded after a loss. Yeah. I, had a, I had a team meeting with my, my head of departments today, and one of them said that what that game actually said in a nutshell was, it was a win, even though it was a loss mm. on the result. And yeah. I think that's, that, that was just incredible. It was an incredible display of greed and desire for the Lions, and you know, they they knew everything was stacked against them. Um, mm. Don't ask me about referee's decision. <laughs> uh, I'll be very conflicted in what I need to say. Uh, but yes, I think that's all we wanted to see. I mean, yeah. you know, yes, you are two men down in regulation time and went down to three. But that's all they wanted to see. They wanted to see the boys playing for what they what they were wearing, the flag and the crest. Yeah. Yeah, I think what's interesting there is you mentioned, you know, there was sort of a renewed interest and there was interest mm. being generated from different people uh, in those situations. So I, I kind of want to ask you then, how do we sort of drive this interest, this renewed interest into um, the Singapore Premier League? And how do we sort of move fans in sort of that direction towards the league and towards supporting our domestic product? You know, I... I, I, I had another experience and this was actually during the first league against Indonesia. Mm. There, there was probably a girl, I think she's probably eight or nine. And when I looked around her, it didn't look like it was, she was with her family who has a relative playing or someone who, uh, who followed Singapore football. But this girl could name every player that was on the pitch. Wow. Yeah. And I thought that was incredible because... You know, that's something people have been comparing, you know, mm. from the likes of Malaysia Cup days when every player was a household name. And I think that has gotten to that bit. And I think that would kind of help us bring that renewed interest into the league because if you look at the players playing there, apart from a couple of them, your Irfans and your ex sons most of them are playing in the domestic league. Mm. And I, I with, with the likes of Sailors, with the likes of Ballester now, you know, upping their game in terms of presence, the likes of Tampines, I think that can be that can be a, 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 a continued interest in local football, not necessarily when the Lions play, but also mm. when the local team play. You know, we, we have sailors who will pick themselves up against very incredible opponents in the Champions yep. League. Roshan, mm. you, yeah. you know yeah. the strengths of those teams that play in the Champions League. And, and how do we ensure that that interest is sustained because if we wait between now and till June to see the Lions back playing in mm. Lions jersey, I think that will be an opportunity lost. We need to continue making sure that these players are there 
their 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 presence is there, whether it's virtually on on social platforms or on on the field of play. So the SPL has a key play, key part to play mm. in this whole interest of Singapore football. Mm. Yasin, you speak about continuity and building on it. One thing that perhaps caught everyone by surprise was the resignation of uh, Tatsuma Yoshida. Um, we would like to talk about him later on, but him as a person, can you just tell us what was he like? Oh, you know, I, um, I, he, he was here for close to three years with us. And I, I've got to give it to him that he doesn't compromise on excellence. Uh, not just on the field of play, um, also, you know, of players in, in every aspect of their life when they're outside the field of play. Uh, and, of course, especially so when, when, when they're on national duty. And I think that kind of wrapped up because he kind of does that to himself. And I'll give you an example. He, when we unveiled him, mm. he couldn't speak a word of English proper. Mm. Right? But he made it a point that I need to connect with fans. I need to connect with players. And I can't do that through a translator. And that's exactly what happened when we unveiled him in, uh, when he first came on board. So he went to take a course on his own accord. I'm not sure how he did it. And then now he does, every time we ask him, do you think you want a translator so it'll be easier for you to put across your thoughts? He said, no, I will handle it. And I think he has done uh, exactly that. And that kind of rubbed off on the players. So as a person... The fact that in his very quiet, unassuming way of wanting excellence in everything he do, I think that was that was a magic. You know, the, the the recruitment of a national head coach is always a roll of a dice. Yeah. Because you 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 you're straight away based on result, your assess on results. And we have seen the likes of our neighbors, you know, bringing in big names to to get it going. And some have failed, some of course got certain results. We've seen the likes of Ericsson. Or Philippines in the last Suzuki Cup. We've seen the likes of uh, Brian Robson in Thailand. And it's always a roll of a dice because it is how much of a connection that they have with the boys, how much the boys understand uh, and, and do what is required as for what the coach wants. But yeah, yeah but I, I, Tatsuma and I, we share a very close relationship um, uh, and we have that mutual trust. And I think that kind of worked well. And that's the reason why, uh, incredibly, it was hard when, you know, I had to accept his resignation. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Yeah, he's gone and I think he's left the team in, in, in a better place as you've described. We'll move it on to, you know, now obviously your, your guys at FAS are busy searching for a replacement. What is FAS looking for amongst the candidates? Maybe it's something that you can share with us. I think, uh, obviously, the parameters has changed with, with the pandemic right now because I think we need to first understand the level of complexity in this new normal, um, especially when you're searching for a personnel for positions that are this critical mm. and also requires some form of a commitment. Um, the long-term commitment is necessary, not just to ensure that the work is continuous or the, the work gets continued with the team, but I think critically just as important that you know, we need to ensure that any localization plans that we have can be explored. Mm. Because mm -hmm. if you bring in someone from foreign, for example, if we are going to go for foreign, not necessarily for the head coach, but for any position, we always need to ask our question. So what happens next? Are we going to continue with the foreign yeah. or is there someone who's going to be mentored in that sense? Mm. So I think that was the first consideration that we had, Roshan, in, in, when we started uh, the recruitment exercise. Um, secondly, and, mm. I, and I think I did uh, mention that in the press release when we announced uh, Tatsuma's departure, um, he, the philosophy that he brought to the team um, of course he brought, brought it to the team and we saw how the Lions play um, but it is not a philosophy or it's not a style of play that is different from many of the current uh, modern coaching uh, mm. philosophies and I think that mm. is also important because our boys are used to it it is in line with what we are preaching to the younger boys at, at, at the levels below and I think we need a coach who will be able to believe in that uh, and understand two things needs to, to happen. One is to understand that that is what we were required to be continued. And secondly, he needs to make everyone understand that in order to get there, it's going to take a while. Um, hmm. Because I think 
we have seen in past experiences where uh, it, it is a results business, right? You know, okay. I, I'll just take a quick uh, comparison with Benitez, who, who, was, who was just <laughs> uh, sacked by Everton, right? That's right. Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan, so we say, yes, well done, Rafa. You know, you've gone there, messed it up, and you left. <laughs> Agent Rafa. Agent Rafa, you're, you're, yeah. you're right. Um, but, you know, I... It, it is very clear. You need to understand what, what is realistic. You need mm. to understand what it takes to bring the current mode or current form into a desire, desired state. And then you manage the expectations. And I think that's mm. what is required. So these are the parameters that we have in place as we look. Because, you know, we, we've had uh, exceptional names that have put their, their names forward to us. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, exceptional names... Uh, is good, but we also need to understand if they can do it mm. with what they will be entrusted with. Yeah. How, how, how far along are we? When can we expect an announcement, do you think? Well, uh, Mustafa asked me this question today and yeah. uh, I, I told him uh, what was the answer I gave so that I just need to be consistent with my answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, we, we, we do have an upcoming FIFA window in January. Yeah. yeah, but even even before the decision of Tatsuma, we agreed that it will not be utilized by us purely because the okay. boys have been away for that long, and we yeah. need to be fair to the clubs to give them preseason time. So we're not going to utilize that. The next window will be in March, mid March, and we will have a coach by then. Okay. Okay. I think okay. the answer is as long as it takes to find the right person. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but you know we we need to have yeah. a coach yeah. in place by March only because. Yeah. Much is the last window before we get into the qualifiers, qualifiers in June. Yes. 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 Okay. Yasin, I have to stick to the topic of employing new people at this point because we are also looking on the lookout for a new TD, technical director. Um, I'm not going to ask you in terms of what you're looking for because it might be similar to your answer, but how is FAS going to ensure the next appointment is the right one in terms of a long-term future? Well, you know, um, if... You know, uh, Roshan, if you were to ask someone, would you rather be a national team coach or a technical director, <laughs> right? And this is purely from a non-technical person's view. Yep. I would say I would rather be a technical director because my roadmap is long. Yes. Right? Um, in terms of finding someone with a long-term commitment, we need to ensure that what is his end goal, right? Mm -hmm. Um we, we had this debate a couple of months ago. I gave an interview uh, with Football Xiao on, on that debate, foreign or local. I think there are different school of thoughts in there. But are we at a state where we can use a local to be able to do that? Or do we need a foreign? Uh, there are merits to both sides of that debate. Um, but what is important, what is very critical, is that this person needs to understand what exists here what mm. cannot be changed. I think it's very easy to understand what can be changed. Yeah. yeah. But it is hard for people to understand what cannot be changed mm. because it is the culture, it is the systems that we have in, in Singapore, it, it, it is the, uh, the ethos that people have, it is the belief that people have. Um, for example, you know, my kids' education is more important than sports, for example. And I think people need to understand, and those are things that you cannot change. And we need to have people wanting to be a TD to come to us and say that, all right, these are the things that I will work around with. And then with a long-term plan, this is what we should achieve. And I think, I hope I've answered your question, uh, Raushan, yeah. on, on finding someone for, for a long term. Yeah, well, I imagine that is another quite a difficult task at hand, right? To, to try and get someone along the lines of what is a uniquely, quite a uniquely Singaporean situation. Mm. Yes, in, mm. And one of the challenges of, of finding the next guy to come in and, and, and sort of do that. Um, listen, let's, uh, let's move it on to, to the Singapore Premier League now, shall we? And uh, we're getting ready for a new season. And I think, you know, quite a few of us excited at what's ahead and what's at stake, you know, especially with Lion City Sailors coming up and winning the title last year. And I think the pressure is going to be on their shoulders mm. to sort of defend the league as well. But in terms of overall growth, Yazin, what uh, is your take on that? How has the league been doing in terms of, of, of growth of the competition? I think we, do, we, we have seen steady growth uh, or at least interest in, in, in the league. Uh, we revamped the league in 2018 
Yes. Um, I didn't sign up for that, to be honest, but I came in <laughs> in 2017. Uh, I, I still remember, I tell people, I, I came in 2017, and then my first thing that was made known to me, your know, budgets are all cut, but you need to achieve a lot more. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I said, okay, I got, I think I, I, I didn't get the memo. But we, when, when we did revamp it in 2018, um, we knew that it needed a, a, a new look. We mm. knew that a, re, a revamped lead will give an impetus for people to want to see what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so we have seen that. We've seen attendance picked up. Uh, maybe not in not like how it used to be in the early part of the league, in the early years mm. of the league. But we have seen that renewed interest. I'm, I'm, ex I'm, you know, I, I incredibly happy when I see fan groups coming. Mm. Uh, for every club, you know, not just the sailors or your fools, but you know, you do see your your yellow knights at Tampines, uh, and 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 your uh, other teams, your your ultras at, at Geelong as well, yeah. yeah, at Geelong. And I think in terms of growth off the pitch, we are seeing a steady increase. Mm. Um, on the pitch, um, we obviously with the introduction of sailors, you know, with, with with the way they go about doing things, uh, whether it's lopsided, there's a debate on that. Is, is, is it putting all the eggs in one team and, and having a lopsided league? That's a debate. But, you know, we saw it last year. It was incredible finish to the league. Mm, uh, yeah. It was not just Albirex that was pushing them. There were other teams that, would, that yeah. did take some points off them as well. And I think sailors have kind of created that, that, that excitement they have created that need to want to compete. Mm. So another club looks at them and says, all right, we may not have the resources like they, that, like they do, but we obviously do have the belief that we can beat them on our given day. Yeah. Mm. And this, you know, I make a, a quick look at down under when, we, uh, when you have Melbourne victory and Melbourne city. And it's the same case. You, you've got two clubs in one city sharing a stadium where one club has got all the resources with, mm. from City Group. And Melbourne Victory's uh, reaction to that was not one where they, they give up and say, okay, I'm not going to be able to compete. But I want to be like that with the resources I have. How can we do that? And I think mm. that kind of you know, brings about that questions that club are now asking themselves. How Gang is, 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 is strengthening their squad. Obviously, they've got AFC yeah. this year. Uh, Tampines has their own way of uh, strengthening their, their sport. I'm told that a lot of young players are coming through. And I think it, does, it will create that environment where the, the level of play will get to increase. Because when you play someone like Sailors, when you play someone like Hao Gang, for example, you want to up your game. And I think that is what we have been seeing. So there's a steady growth. Of course, mm. not at the level yet, that we envision, but there is a steady growth. And you know, just just before you ask me about privatization, <laughs> when we get to privatization, and I think that's what will entice your your private stakeholders to come on board, because I think that's very important in in many leagues around the world. The reason why they thrive is not just of government funding uh, or community funding, but rather is the private investors that who see value beyond football. And yeah. I think football aspect. Or, or, or the non-football aspect of a club can be something that could be very enticing for these private entities to come on board. Uh, I was going to jump in there because from, from my perspective, I have to be honest, it looks like it's, it's quite a long way away, it's privatisation. And it, it seems like something that's been spoken about in the past, but we perhaps never have quite achieved it. So how do we then go about creating this value? You mentioned value and, and outside entities seeing value in in the local clubs. How, how do we do that? How do we entice these, these uh, organizations to come in and support these teams and support the league? You know, it's, it's the, the first thing people would say is real estate. Uh, mm. Do our clubs have real estate? And yeah. obviously that's a, a, a big ask in, in a country like Singapore. Um, but then how do we go about uh, knowing that real estate would be a problem. I mean, those sailors, uh, there's an article about sailors wanting to buy over a stadium. <laughs> yes. Right? Whether that's going to happen, how long it's going to take, that remains to be seen. But there are other aspects because, like I said, um, 
increasingly organizations are trying to find avenues in which they can connect better with communities, uh, which is something that the clubs can take advantage of. Mm. Um, that's just one part. Obviously, they need to have confidence in the product. Yeah. Right. Um, why didn't we go to the private entities in 2018? Because the product mm. was not there, was not, yeah. was, was not good enough, was not attractive enough. So if we work on, uh, on certain implementation milestones with the vision that the product must, must become more attractive, then you do have a chance to attract them. Of course, you, you can go to some private entities and they can be uh, unflexed to come in and support, but that's not going to be sustainable. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Not going to be you need genuine people coming on board, seeing a value in the product and seeing the value in what the product can bring for their business needs. And I think that's when we would be able to find a successful marriage of the two. Yeah, you don't want a situation of what has happened in, in China, for example, right? Where government basically said, we're going to focus on football, World Cup this, World Cup that. And, and organizations, private entities were said were encouraged to pick up sticks in clubs and it's it's all sort of the bubble has has popped. Uh, Raushan, where are we moving on to next, man? So you guys are talking about this long-term project. I want to keep it in the here and now just because I'm so excited for the season that's coming up ahead. Yasin, if you can just give our listeners, give our viewers some insight into what they can expect in the year ahead because all's well and good talking about the long term, but I think with the renewed interest, fans will be excited to know what they can expect in 2022. Well, from the league standpoint, um, I don't want to jump the gun before my colleagues will announce what's happening to the league uh, that will happen. I think we will announce in a week or two. Uh, but yes, of course, the league is going to start very soon. Um, and But it is a packed calendar. I, mm. To be, to be <laughs> honest, you know, I, I've got my head of competition whose position no one wants to be in because he, he needs to adjust the league in such a way that every competition that's going to, that's going to happen this year is not affected. Um, we we do have the under 23 AFF in Cambodia that's starting next month and then you have the league then you have the SEA Games uh, you have the national teams June uh, qualification for Asian Cup and then if we do get selected we also have the Asian Games in August uh, at the same time we have the women's AFF as well and then mm. we have the, the, oh, the league will continue and then, of course, we have World Cup, right? We are not participating in World Cup, but when World Cup comes around, everything shuts down. Okay? Yeah. So, so it, it's, a short, it's a short calendar, once again, but it is a packed calendar. And mm. I think uh, what fans can look forward to is there will be continuation of events. As you mentioned, Raushan, I think we want to go beyond just hosting the, uh, the likes of Suzuki Cup. Uh, we need to bring the bigger tournaments here because if you, if you look at it, um, the magic of Suzuki when we play Malaysia, we play Thailand, we play Indonesia, you know, the excitement that builds on, is it because of the geographical proximity of the rivalry that we have? Mm. I'm not sure. But at the same time, when we play the likes of Saudi Arabia or Uzbekistan, who are mm. top notches in terms yeah. of FIFA ranking, the interest is not as replicated as what we would have seen yeah. or what we did see in Suzuki. But I think we need to bring that kind of competition. We need to fans to understand that playing such matches is actually beneficial to our team. You know, of course, results are important. Of course, results you know, helps you in shouting a lot more of, of, of the team and stuff. But you know, there are other measures of success that we need to acknowledge and to put in place for, for, the, for, for the betterment of the team. So, so that's what you fans can expect to see us hosting a lot more, uh, even more bigger, or more bigger competitions than the Suzuki. Hmm. Yasin, I had a quick chuckle earlier when you were mentioning everything in the calendar because have you told your wife about your pick schedule for the year? Because <laughs> it looks like December leaf is off the cards this year as well. Yeah. Well... I don't think she will like the idea of me saying, let's go to Qatar for a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying my luck with my wife, so I'll tell you any tips that I can off the call, perhaps. <laughs> uh, Rosh, anything else for Yazin? No, man, I think the, I think, uh, the insight that he's provided has been excellent. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate you, Yazin, taking the time once again in the FAS for helping us out with this and uh, for doing such a great job in helping the growth of Singapore football. And hopefully it can continue. 
Thanks, Roshan. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, I've been, like I said, I've been as open as I can. Uh, <laughs> and, but no, thank you to you guys, because I think, you know, podcasters like yours is what drives that that whole community, because we, we can't, like I said, right, we, we can't rely just on how traditional uh, announcements are made or traditional yeah. shout outs are made. So thank you to you guys for wanting to be part of this. That's it. It's been immense pleasure speaking to you, fans, listeners, followers. It's not every day we get the GenSec of the Football Association of Singapore join us for such a candid conversation. So keep the conversation going in the comments below. Like, share, subscribe. Till the next episode, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys.